Roman Empire, the last superpower of the ancient world. Founded on military might and ruled by emperors, it was controlled from one city, Rome. With a population of one million, Rome was confident, cosmopolitan, and futuristic. Rome contained wonders of architecture and engineering. There were aqueducts and roads radiating from the city. There was the Pantheon, with the largest dome of its type ever built. Rome's architecture was cosmopolitan. The Forum was a public square with the world's first shopping mall. Rome was also decadent. The thermal baths of the Emperor Caracalla were a glamorous pleasure palace. Rome was built to excite. The Circus Maximus was twice the size of the largest stadium today. And then there was the Colosseum, an arena of entertainment, but a cathedral of death. What chilling stories are locked within its dark corridors. The seven wonders of Rome pushed back the boundaries of what was possible. How were the Romans able to make such breakthroughs? Over a thousand years in advance of the rest of the world. The emperors of ancient Rome could be cruel and ruthless, but they were never safe. With the stakes so high, danger was never far away. Some stayed alive by giving the people what they wanted. Others protected their reputations by building awe-inspiring wonders way beyond anything ever seen before. Rome became like nowhere on earth. It had shopping centers and health spas, a road system, running water, and sanitation. The Roman people were given wonders of architecture which were out of this world, and entertainment beyond their wildest dreams. No building could entertain more people than the Circus Maximus. It was the largest arena ever constructed. It held twice the number of spectators of today's biggest stadium. It offered the Romans the spectacle of speed, danger, and death. A third of a mile long and 150 yards wide, the Circus Maximus was the arena for great spectacle, wild beasts, gladiators, and most famously, chariot racing. It could hold up to 350,000. Admission was free, paid for by the state. But for the Emperor Trajan who built it, it was well worth it. This was premium advertising space. Trajan, like most emperors, wanted to build a lasting monument to his own glory, and the Circus Maximus was the obvious place. There he could meet the crowds, and he could meet them famously on, uh, on the same level. Trajan fancied himself a man of the people. The arena allowed Trajan to entertain one-third of Rome's population in one sitting. In the middle of the track, he built a centerpiece 1,000 feet long. It was called the Spina, and represented the broken back of Rome's enemies. The centerpiece was an obelisk towering 80 feet high. It had once displayed the power of Ramesses II, the greatest pharaoh. Now it had a new master, Rome. Earlier attempts at building stadiums had all ended in disaster. The very first Circus Maximus was built 500 years earlier. Made of wood, the structure was prone to fire and had to be replaced many times. But by 100 AD, Trajan set about rebuilding it once and for all. Trajan's Circus Maximus became the most successful stadium. The secret of its survival was down to the newly discovered miracle building material, concrete. This magical mixture was to liberate architecture, and the Romans were the first to develop it. When the Circus Maximus was built, only the top section was constructed from wood. The first three floors, near to the shops and stores, were built from concrete and decorated with brick and marble. 
This fireproof structure allowed shops to be developed right along the length of the stadium. And despite the risk of fire from the many arcades and shops, the building survived for 500 years. The Roman people had never experienced a stadium like it. Today, only the scant outline of its foundations remain. But once the Circus Maximus was the busiest building on Earth. When you arrived at the Circus Maximus, you would enter the structure through an arched gate and arrive in a system of corridors, looking almost underground, so that when you got out towards your seat, you would be blinded, and you would need a second to adjust your eyes to the spectacle in front of you. Trajan's construction, over 100 feet high, contained four banks of tiered seating. It looped around the track to a length of nearly 1,500 yards. The writer Pliny described it as beautiful as a temple, a sight to be seen for its own sake, quite apart from the spectacles contained therein. The arena had to be strong enough to contain some uncontrollable spectacles. At one event, 63 leopards, 40 bears and elephants were released. To increase crowd safety, a ditch was dug running 10 feet wide and 10 deep all around the edge. The Emperor Nero introduced a barrier covered in smooth ivory, which revolved when touched and allowed animals no grip to climb it. It meant the action could take place right in front of the spectators. The Circus Maximus was so large, it needed spectacle on a grand scale, and nothing gripped the Roman crowds more than chariot racing. The race begins when a handkerchief is dropped, signaling its start. The gates open, all 12 chariots emerge at once. They have to stay in straight lines for a few moments, and then at a certain point, they're all allowed to go as they like. They then race uh, hell for leather for seven times around the uh, circus, and finally across the finishing line, which is uh, opposite the imperial box with the empress. Just like motor racing today, the course was being continually updated. The most dangerous parts of the track were the corners, where the teams cut the shortest course around the turning post. Chariots would collide and charioteers would be trampled underfoot. 50 died every year. If they managed to survive, charioteers became glamorous superstars. We do know the name of one charioteer, Scorpus, and from him we get just a, just a glimpse of the, uh, of the excitement and the glamour and sometimes the pathos that was associated with being a charioteer. He won 2,000 races, but he died in the, uh, in the Circus Maximus, only age 27. Spectators placed bets on the different colored teams. Men, women, and children would watch the racing. The Circus Maximus made the Emperor Trajan popular, but he didn't stop there. He became one of Rome's greatest builders and went on to construct another wonder of architecture called Trajan's Forum. Forum is a cultural symbol of a Roman city. It's the central place of a Roman town where people come to meet. And it usually has a temple on one side and a basilica, a judgment hall on another side. So this is the central place, the Times Square, or the Piccadilly Circus of Rome. There were already five forums in Rome, but none of them could compete with the scale of Trajan's. Trajan built it to ensure his popularity but also to make himself truly Roman. Trajan was the first of the non-Italian emperors, so he was from Spain, quite a good soldier. He was the second of the so-called five good emperors, so he was chosen for his abilities rather than because of who his father was. Trajan was a self-made man and an empire builder. Not surprisingly, he chose as his architect a man who also came from outside Italy, a Greek called Apollodorus. He'd helped Trajan on his military operations abroad. We don't know as much about Apollodorus' career as we would like, and this is true for most Roman architects. He was Trajan's chief architect, was responsible for the construction of bridges during the campaign in Dacia, as well as Trajan's forum. The money from the Dacian campaigns allowed Apollodorus to pull out every stop to make his emperor's forum a showcase. The piazza alone was over 200 yards long, 
and surrounded by elaborate arcades and adorned with statues of Trajan. There was a marketplace, a library, as well as law courts. Trajan's military victories financed the building. They were recorded on a magnificent column dominating the site. For the average Roman, to enter Trajan's Forum was to enter another world. The poor Roman escaping from his stuff, crowded, cramped living conditions, goes into this glorious mass of gleaming marble and sees the gilded bronze roofs above him of the palace. He's moved into a completely different world. It's like going onto a film set. But Trajan's Forum would be far more than a public square. To seal the public's approval, Trajan now began developing the world's first shopping mall. It became known as Trajan's Markets. He cleared away a hillside 125 feet high and built the complex in terraces adjoining his forum. This was futuristic design, an entire center of different spaces on different levels with raised walkways and streets containing 150 shops on five floors. And here for the moment, we're walking along a corridor on which open up some of the shops of this complex. As you can see, a shop had its entire facade opening up on a street or on a corridor. The construction methods were new, fast and economical. The walls were only faced in brick. To save money, the bricks were cut in half, and the newfound mixture of concrete and rubble on the inside of the wall made it possible to build five stories high. On the fifth floor was the corn dole, where free rations were handed out. Beneath, arcades of shops offered every commodity from across the empire. The finest silks, rare spices and precious gems, as well as everyday goods, were all for sale in a variety of covered markets. A place for Romans to mix and relax, to eat and drink, to browse and buy anything they wanted. There were bars and takeaway food stores. Trajan helped to make Rome the most sophisticated place on earth. The city had every technology. One of its greatest wonders was its aqueducts. Aqueducts were an engineering breakthrough. They brought the purest water directly to the homes of Rome's one million citizens. Graceful arches spanning the countryside and amazing tunnels below the ground brought an incredible 200 million gallons of fresh water into the city every day. This incredible system became the life force of Rome and the engineering blueprint for every modern city ever since. Roman scientists like Vitruvius had made detailed studies of water. They tested it by boiling it away and studying the residue it left. They studied the effects of contamination from different soils. They studied the plants attracted to water, bulrushes, wild osseas, alders, withy, and reeds. Later, under the Emperor Trajan, an entire government department was set up, headed by a famous engineer called Frontinus. It had long been established that the freshest water came not from the river Tiber, but from the foothills and natural springs outside Rome. Provided they flowed from high ground, the springs could be channeled through aqueducts down to the city below. As Roman engineers became more experienced, they were able to defy any obstacle. In time, they would construct a 260-mile-long network of tunnels and aqueducts. Before building could start, the degree of slope had to be determined. This angle would become the incline of the aqueduct across hills and valleys all the way to Rome. Before any water entered the aqueduct, it passed through several purification tanks. Here, flow rate was restricted to allow impurities to fall as sediment. Along most of their route from the hills of Rome into the city, 
stretches of up to seven miles, the aqueducts would have been in tunnels like this one, dug often straight through hillsides or under towns and villages. They were dug by hand and beautifully built, so much so that they're the only ancient Roman public service still in regular use today. To tunnel, the engineers used the Roman mining technique of drilling a vertical shaft every 35 yards as the tunnel progressed through the hill. This meant they could check their alignment accurately by dropping down plumb lines. But when the aqueduct appeared the other side, the land often sloped away towards the city. So to maintain the flow gradient, the channel had to be raised and supported by a wall of brick or stone. As the ground sloped away further, so the wall was built up. But when it exceeded six feet, it became too costly to build. The solution was an architectural innovation the Romans perfected, the arch. This is an absolutely standard semicircular Roman arch built with cut stones. It's about 18 foot span, and there may be a 27 stones in the whole arch. The Roman engineers used formwork, a wooden supporting frame over which the arch was assembled. When the stones were in place, cement was applied and then rubble to build the structure up to the top. Once the keystone is in, they can strike the wooden frame and let the arch take the weight and all that force coming down the stones finally through the piers to the ground. Then they can finish the aqueduct on top. With arches, aqueducts could cross valleys. But arches could become unsteady. So Roman engineers had to explore every technique to make them stable. When an aqueduct crossed a river, greater stability was given to the base by specially shaping it to deflect the current. But when arches grew too tall, they could twist and become unstable. So the Roman solution was to limit their height to just 70 feet. Sometimes, to maintain the correct gradient, the aqueducts needed to be even higher. So a second tier of arches was placed above the first. One aqueduct was even built with three tiers, 180 feet high. For Roman aqueducts, cement would bring about a breakthrough when engineers discovered a waterproof cement to line the bottom of the channel. It was made from pozzolama, a volcanic ash which, when mixed with lime, became a mortar which could even set hard underwater. But why go to all this architectural expense when a pipeline would have done the same job? The Romans could have brought the water to Rome by pipeline running along the ground surface, but of course that would have had problems to do with the pressure in the pipe. So by putting the water up here on an aqueduct in a channel instead of in a pipe, they could supply it easily and quickly with a simple form of construction. It's covered, of course, to protect it from evaporating and from getting dirty with things blowing into it. Roman thinking was that if pipes were hidden underground, any break would be hard to detect and repair. Pipes could only be made out of terracotta. Roman engineers avoided lead. It was expensive and known to be poisonous. They also learned that pipes collect sediment which sat at the low points in the system, creating pressure points. The great advantage of aqueducts was that they could be easily inspected and maintained. Aqueducts could easily cross plains, but very deep valleys and ravines were a problem. To cross them, the Roman engineers built a cistern each side. Then they funneled the water down a pipe. Its own weight would push it up the other side the first gravity-driven siphon. When the water finally entered Rome, it filled three reservoirs. The first served the essential public supply, the second the public baths, and the third went to private households who paid a water tax. The money levied from the private sector helped to pay for the public water system, which took priority. The public always had plenty. Controlling the public was the number one concern of every emperor. Their lives depended on it. Trajan had given Rome the first permanent stadium, a forum, a shopping center, and regulated the water supply. 
100 years later, Rome was under the control of the Emperor Caracalla, and he was to build the Roman people the most lavish public building ever conceived. It was, in effect, a public palace, the most luxurious and sophisticated health spa of all time. And everyone could go there. Why was Caracalla so generous? What they were concerned with is with their reputation, with their eternal reputation, with building some things that people would remember them for, the baths of Caracalla. But behind the beauty of Caracalla's baths lay a harsh reality. Caracalla's full name was Emperor Marcus Aurelius Severus Antonius Pius Felix Augustus, remembered chillingly as Caracalla. Like Caligula and Nero before him, Caracalla was one of Rome's most terrifying rulers. Caracalla was so hated, he decided to build for the people of Rome a wonder to reverse his failing image. But why build a bath complex? One of the most evil emperors, Caracalla, a genuine psychopath if ever there was one, oddly enough, chose to build baths as his monument. Now, what does this mean to us? Well, one way of thinking about this would be an obsessional streak, wanting to wash and clean and cleanse and purify, a kind of way of expressing perhaps even some guilt about what he had done. Rome already had nearly a 1,000 public baths, but Caracalla's overshadowed them all. They covered over 11,000 square yards, the central space alone was larger than the Basilica of St. Peter's, and a branch line was built from the Aqua Marcia to supply them with their own water. Caracalla's cruelty never ceased. His builders were forced to work around the clock in all weathers. Begun in 212 AD, his baths were completed in record time. Caracalla employed a workforce of up to 16,000 men, 100,000 scaffolding poles, allowed 4,500 bricklayers and 1,800 decorators to get to work. Caracalla's accountants grew worried. The soaring cost of building the baths began to equal all imperial expenses. The annual expense of running the army, the corn dole, all state salaried staff, as well as imperial gifts and foreign subsidies. But Caracalla couldn't stop spending. No expense was spared. Bathers could swim in Olympic-sized swimming pools, rest in enormous sauna rooms, laze in a warm bath 170 feet long, and cool in a plunge pool. There was a gymnasium and exercise rooms, as well as libraries, meeting rooms, and gardens. A vast system supplied the baths with over two million gallons of water. It was piped beneath the main building, where it either fed the cold pools or the boilers. An underground network of terracotta pipes distributed gallons of hot and cold water while removing all wastewater. There were also enormous corridors storing 2,000 tons of wood. There were 50 fireplaces for the heating of the different rooms above. This system of efficient underfloor heating was known as hypercaust. Terracotta tubes ran inside the walls to provide insulation and channel hot air. The underworld is sweaty, hot, fearsomely hot, oppressed, cruel, and above, they're the leisured class enjoying their luxury and cleanliness. There could be as many as 2,000 people in the baths. You could spend the whole day at the baths. There was plenty to do there. It would take you quite a long time to get through all the different rooms. There was a sort of Turkish bath kind of room. There was a cold room. There was a warm room. There was a swimming pool. You could get a massage. You could get your hair done. You could get your pedicure and your manicure. But you also could have some very important chats. You were very interested in who you might bump into. And there was certainly food and drink available. The main pool, the Caledarium, was the hottest room. It was domed to allow in the sun's heat and light. The baths were popular and long-lasting, qualities that eclipsed Caracalla. On the 8th of April, in the year 217 AD, 
scarcely one year from the Bard's completion, Caracalla was murdered, assassinated by his own bodyguard. The Roman people enjoyed the Bards for centuries, but were quick to forget Caracalla, one of the most flawed emperors of all time. Despite poor rulers, turmoil and revolution, Rome would become the nerve center of a vast empire. And all this was made possible by the wonder of Roman roads. The first Roman road was the Appian Way, begun in 312 BC by the consul Claudius. Within 200 years, a 180,000 mile network would spread out from the city to reach the furthest extremities of the empire. Along them marched great armies. Soon the whole of Europe to the west, Judea to the east, and Egypt to the south fell under Rome's control. At their height, Roman roads were expanding at the rate of a mile every three days. Yet they've survived to this day. What was the secret of their construction? The answer lay in surveying. For this, Roman engineers invented a device called a groma. The principles of Roman surveying are the same principles that we use today, setting things out on right angles, using level to work out elevation and so on. You'd first of all sight down one axis of it, like this, and then you'd move around and lay out the other line at right angles. And that was pretty effective over short distances. For long distances, the Romans had to use the highest hills they could see in the distance, and they set out poles between where they were, where they wanted to go, and aligned them in a very, very long line, as straight as they could. They couldn't survey round corners. That's why all Roman roads are straight. If the obstacle was impassable, the road would take a dog leg around it. But often, the roads were cut straight through entire hillsides. The Emperor Trajan engineered a cutting 120 feet deep to extend the Appian Way along the coast. The idea of building a straight road from scratch was a new one. Up until now, roads had evolved from ancient tracks. They sidestepped rivers and avoided hills. But to the Roman mind, this was inefficient. Nothing would stand in the way of the Via Appia. And when the road came to marshland, a special causeway was laid beneath it. This consisted of a wooden platform. Posts were driven into the swamp, supporting a frame. Sometimes entire tree trunks were laid across, before the road was built up with a layer of limestone flags covered with pebbles and gravel. The Roman roads were built very carefully because they were the core of the Roman communication system. Making roads was a serious business because the roads served many purposes. Transportation of troops, of goods, and they were built by slaves, by soldiers, and lower class citizens who would work in private construction companies. One of the astounding features of Roman roads is how durable they proved to be. They were all built to the same formula. A broad trench was dug and filled with sand and boulders to form a solid foundation. Next went a layer of gravel and coarse stone. This was mixed with clay or mortar before being compacted. Finally, a layer of cambered paving stones, sometimes of basalt, formed the top surface, allowing any water to drain off to the sides. Every thousand paces or Roman mile was marked by a cylindrical milestone engraved with details of the current emperor and the distance to the next town. Camps and staging posts were installed every 10 miles. During the reign of Augustus, when news of a German invasion of France reached Rome, soldiers were dispatched immediately. Marching along the new roads at a record speed of 20 miles every five hours, disaster was soon averted. While roads held the empire together, it was architecture that displayed Roman mastery of the world. The most visionary Roman building remains a landmark in world architecture, the Pantheon. It is a temple dedicated to all the gods and was built by the Emperor Hadrian 
in 125 AD. Like a time capsule, the Pantheon remains the best preserved Roman building, marking one of the greatest achievements in world architecture. Its central feature, an oculus, a circular hole 30 feet wide, open to the heavens. Its dome, 143 feet across, meant its designers were taking a risk. It was the largest ever made without reinforced concrete. The Pantheon was an obsession for the Emperor Hadrian. He was fascinated by architecture. Hadrian could draw his own architectural plans and blueprints. He had his own villa built as an Egyptian temple. It's not known which architect designed the Pantheon. Some believe it was Apollodorus, but there are no surviving records. The facade of the Pantheon was designed to express Roman mastery of the world. The Greek portico was supported by 16 of the finest columns. Made from Egyptian granite, they were quarried thousands of miles away in Aswan, Lower Egypt, and brought all the way to Rome. The crossbeams running above them were once sheathed in bronze. From here, two gigantic bronze doors, 21 feet high, open onto a vast circular area, half the size of a football pitch. The interior of the Pantheon is a fantastic space, thanks to its enormous dome, twice as big as any dome that had ever been built before, 44 meters of span. Inside, the only thing you can think of is space. The Pantheon is one of the most famous buildings of the world and one of the best preserved, and yet still enigmatic. We don't know what its original name was. We don't know what it was exactly used for. The Pantheon was a fusion of both classical and modern styles. It had no architectural precedent. The whole space inside was unsupported, unique in temple design. The Pantheon's dome was an engineering masterpiece. Other domes had been constructed in Roman architecture before the Pantheon, in bath buildings in particular, but the Pantheon covered a span greater than that of any other ancient structure, and it wouldn't be superseded until the Renaissance. Building the dome of the Pantheon was the biggest engineering challenge that the Romans ever set themselves. It had twice the span of any dome that they built previously. The key problem with building any dome is how to stop it collapsing under its own weight. All the time, it's trying to push out at the bottom and to fall through the middle. The Romans solved this in two ways. Firstly, they made it very, very thick. And then to stop the dome spreading outwards at the bottom, they built it inside massive buttress-like walls and with a ring of collars around the base of the dome itself. This was a brilliant solution. The architect had planned for the weight of the giant semi-sphere to be supported by just eight piers. These needed to be strong and were built 20 feet thick. But to help reduce their overall weight, they had hollow inspection shafts running up inside them. The dome itself is a highly advanced piece of futuristic engineering. Its construction had been worked out to reduce its weight and pressure. It contains many sophisticated features, and its builders used five different types of cement to build it. The shape of the dome was exquisitely proportioned, being exactly half the dimension of the whole building. Climbing from the ground to the first cornice, the builders used heavy concrete and tufa blocks. The next level was built from lighter tufa bricks. The first ring of the dome was made of concrete, but as it grew upwards, the concrete became thinner and was lightened with tufa. At the top, it was lightened further with pumice. Had the architect not reduced the weight in this way, the stresses would have been increased by as much as 80%. The architect hid inside the walls a complicated series of arches. These were designed to reduce weight and to direct the pressure down onto the supporting piers. The 
architect further reduced the weight of the dome by cutting out large square panels called coffers. These gave added rhythm and decoration, as well as losing many tons of weight. The coffers of the dome were gilded, and so it would have resembled a kind of golden canopy above your head. It was built using a self-supporting wooden frame beneath it. This determined the shape of the coffers and moldings. At the top was the oculus, a circular opening almost 30 feet across, allowing an open view to the heavens. This ingenious feature removed the point of maximum stress from the dome and has helped to ensure the building's survival. History does not record who was responsible for the Pantheon's revolutionary design. Whether it was Apollodorus or the emperor himself remains unknown. The historian Cassius Dio tells a story about Apollodorus and Hadrian, wherein Hadrian showed some of his architectural designs to Apollodorus, who criticized them severely. And according to Dio, ultimately, Hadrian had Apollodorus executed. If the story is true, Apollodorus never saw the Pantheon completed. But the most intriguing puzzle within the Pantheon is not who built it or the dome, but the facade. The riddle lies in the height of the columns. The portico appears about 10 feet too short. One possible reason for this was that Hadrian wanted the columns specially made from Egyptian granite. They'd be highly expensive to quarry and bring back to Rome, but would display absolute power. To be in correct proportion, they needed to be 50 feet high. For an impatient emperor like Hadrian, this would mean a long wait, something he could not be seen having to do. Neither could he be seen to have second best and use marble. So it appears Hadrian had to break the laws of proportion and settle for granite columns just 40 feet high. The design of its facade remains a mystery, but the Pantheon continues to astound the world. The last of Rome's seven wonders is the most infamous building on Earth, the Colosseum. Behind its beautiful walls were once terrifying scenes of combat, of blood, of death. The building was the largest and most notorious of all Roman amphitheaters. Standing taller than 16 stories, the Colosseum could hold a crowd of over 80,000. It was an arena of entertainment and a cathedral of death. Plans to build the Colosseum began after the death of the Emperor Nero. His rule of terror had left public morale so low that Vespasian, who followed him, had to build something exceptional to win back public support. Vespasian was something of an anomaly amongst the Roman emperors. He was hardworking, sober, a plain dealer, honest, frugal. The Romans liked him. In AD 70, Vespasian's engineers drained Nero's private lake and laid the foundations for Rome's largest amphitheater. The oval design encompassed a central arena. High banked terraces were designed to give every spectator a clear view of the ring. Inside, there was a labyrinth of vaulted tunnels. There were 76 entrances allowing crowds of spectators to swarm along the passages to the seats above. Inside, the whole structure rested upon load-bearing piers, braced with arches and vaults. Vaulting gives us this domed roof, like the one above me, made out of a Roman concrete placed on a wooden frame or formwork, and arches like this one, made out of cut stone blocks. Together, the arches and the vaults give us a wide, open public space for people to mingle and circulate. And the arches give the Colosseum its distinctive architectural appearance all around the outside. Moving up the facade, the first three floors were arched. The fourth and fifth were solid walls of concrete faced with brick. Modern building techniques enabled the 150-foot high facade to be put up quickly. 300 tons of iron cramps helped to bond all the masonry together. 
standard sizes of brick and easily mixable concrete allowed production line efficiency on site. Vespasian had no time to lose. He was in a hurry to win back the people before his years overtook him. The Colosseum was the answer. And as emperor, he would have the best seat. Beside him would sit senators. On the tier above, noblemen. Above, soldiers and citizens. Above them, slaves. The worst seats of all on the very top story were for women. What this meant was that the place was a, a microcosm of Roman society. And when you looked out at it, graphically, you saw it affect the whole Roman world displayed before you. Above, an awning protected the spectators from the sun. 1,000 sailors were stationed in Rome to erect its sails. One of the astonishing things is that this great, massive edifice, probably the greatest building project, certainly the most complex one of antiquity, was put together in a period of perhaps five years. Yet despite the speed of its construction, Vespasian would never live to see the Colosseum's completion. He died before his great gift was realized. It would be his son Titus who would officially open the most terrifying arena on earth. For a hundred days, he treated the people of Rome to the killing of wild beasts, the executions of men, women, and children, as well as gladiatorial contests. This industrial-scale slaughter was all made possible by engineering. Hidden beneath the arena, a labyrinth of tunnels allowed stage sets and dead bodies to be moved in and out. There were 32 animal pens holding caged lions, tigers, elephants, and crocodiles. But by turning a winch, the doors of their cages could be opened, and trapdoors would release the bewildered and hungry creatures into the arena. As many as 5,000 a day were slaughtered. Some species were reduced to the point of extinction. It really was death on an industrial scale, and it had to run like clockwork. There's a story about one emperor, Claudius, who actually threw some of his, uh, his scenic designers and, and stage technicians to the lions because the, uh, the machinery had broken down and the show didn't go on well. Executions provided popular midday entertainment. Christians, Jews, criminals, and slaves were tortured to death in the most novel ways to provide the greatest spectacle. It's certain that they had a different level of tolerance for watching humans and animals suffer terrible pain without feeling they needed to get up and stop it. The highlights of any day were the gladiators. Many were enslaved prisoners of war from conquered tribes, the Samnites, the Thracians, and the Gauls. After the opening of the Colosseum, new gladiator schools opened beside it. Soon, there were 2,000 trained gladiators ready to fight for their lives. One of the Romans' favorite ways of varying the diet of gladiatorial combat was to make the gladiators take on identities of mythical characters in a big fight. So you could have Achilles fighting Hector, or you could have Hercules fighting one of his great enemies. And they would fight to the death, but in a form of disguise and impersonation that's actually got more to do with theater. If they lived long enough to see out their contracts, they could become free men. The Colosseum made some gladiators into heroes and superstars. Some would be given a second chance. Others would die within its walls. Their bodies dragged away at the end of a contest. 42 emperors would benefit from Vespasian's vision. The Colosseum was a building designed to keep the people happy. It succeeded, but the price was high. 700,000 souls would die within its walls. The Colosseum remains today as a masterpiece of design, shrouding the darkest memories of the most ruthless civilization. The Seven Wonders of Rome were all outstanding creations, pushing architecture and engineering to a level unsurpassed for well over a thousand years. The audacity of their construction still challenges architects to better them, to develop new materials, to solve new problems, to do as the Romans did and build into the future.